Welcome to Much More on Medicine on the ThinkTech Live Streaming Network series, broadcasting from our downtown studio at Pioneer Plaza in downtown Honolulu. I'm your host, Katherine Knorr. Joining me in the studio today is Dr. Kent Reinker. Today we're going to talk about innovation in kids' bone surgery. Remember that our talk shows are streamed live on the internet from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. every weekday, and earlier shows are streamed all night long. All our shows are streamed on Livestream.com. If you want the links to our live streams or previous broadcasts, which are available on YouTube.com, or if you want to subscribe to our programs or get on our mailing list and get our program advisories, go to ThinkTechHawaii.com. I'm delighted to be talking with Dr. Kent Reinker today. He's currently a clinical professor for University of Texas Health Sciences Center. He was a chief surgeon and chief of medical staff at Shriners Hospital for Children in Honolulu from 1989 to 2001. Before that, Dr. Reinker was the chief of orthopedic surgery and director of orthopedic residency at Tripler Army Medical Center. He's retired as a, he retired as a colonel in 1989. I know Dr. Reinker because he's the author of a half dozen novels under the pen names Elaine Gunn and AK Gunn. Welcome, Dr. Reinker. It's great to have you. It's so nice to be here. Thank you very much. Okay, fantastic. So what does a pediatric, pediatric surgeon do? Um, a pediatric orthopedic surgeon, uh, which is what I am, uh, basically takes care of any kind of crippled children uh, problem in uh, children. And uh, it's a very wide ranging uh, uh, specialty. Uh, it, it involves fractures or, uh, or uh, scoliosis work uh, or uh, taking care of congenital abnormalities and genetic uh, disorders of various sorts, cerebral palsy. Uh, it's very wide ranging, probably the most wide ranging of all uh, fields of surgery, really. Okay, and um, I have a plate and four screws in my wrist. And so what I was wondering is would it be different? for uh, you to do orthopedic surgery, such as an implant, on an adult versus a child? Well, adults are pretty easy, actually, because you don't have to worry about growth. And uh, as soon as you're talking about a child, you have to start uh, talking about uh, how the things are going to grow. So um, if you put in a plate, for example, uh, and uh, you have to make sure that the uh, that uh, the plate uh, will grow as the child, and and the, the design of implants is is important. Uh, so, for example, if I were to take a metal rod that I might use for spine surgery, that's normally five to six millimeters in uh, in uh, diameter. Um, if I take that and make it half size for a small child, it will lose seven eighths of its strength. So. As we get smaller implants to, to be, be used on children's bones, which are smaller, uh, then the strength goes down as well. So for children, we have to, we have to uh, really redesign the implant uh, completely uh, uh, for, uh, different, uh, for different age group. Okay, so I'm curious, does the work in orthopedic uh, pediatric surgery does that require creativity? Uh, it's probably the most creative of all, of all uh, surgical specialties, really, uh, because um, we're constantly seeing kids that have uh, things that we've never seen before. Uh, so every, every week in clinic, I would uh, see some syndrome or disease that I hadn't seen before that uh, has uh, very unique uh, uh, problems associated with it. So, um, uh, it's one thing for me to see a child, for example, that has uh, a duplication of toes. So if you have six toes, that's fairly easy to handle. But if you've got seven toes or eight toes or nine toes, then uh, that be means I'm going to have to design an operation to, uh, to take care of your particular problem. 
And it's not going to be like uh, any operation I've done before. So I'm constantly faced uh, every every week probably I do a surgery that uh, that is uh, very unique and uh, designed specifically for that particular patient. So you mentioned the challenges with growth. Does that mean that as a child grows that you have to do surgery to accommodate that growth and in terms of putting different sizes of the implant in? Yeah, that's correct. So it, it, we have to, uh, the, the, the three big problems are uh, sizing it so that it'll do the job and have the strength to do the job, uh, plus, uh, uh, um, uh, plus stay around for long enough. Uh, so um, when you're talking about a child, uh, the child has 70 years, 80 years of uh, that the implant is probably going to be in the body unless it's taken out at some point. Um, if I'm talking about an adult, it may be only need to be in for 10 years or 20 years. So a total hip that's put in a 70-year-old uh, is, is maybe going to be in there for 20 years. If I put a total hip in an 11-year-old, then it's going to be in there for a considerably longer uh, length of time. So we have to plan on that. Plus, the children, uh, we want them to grow. We don't want to put an implant in that will prevent the growth that they normally do. And the third thing is uh, children are uh, not going to be sedentary. They're going to do things that kids do. So I don't want to put something in that's uh, not going to be allow him to go out and play and do all the things that a normal child can do. So, um, so we have specific problems in children that, uh, that are uh, really, uh, we don't face so much in adults. Uh, and so is it, do you enjoy uh, working with children when it comes to doing implants? Oh, children are, are wonderful patients to begin with. And, uh, and yes, if you design the implant properly and if it's, uh, 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 if it's used properly, uh, then you're, and you, you've thought out the, the problem that this particular child has, you're going to get great results, generally speaking. So it's, it's a very happy profession, actually. We, we take kids, we make, uh, we do something fairly, not straightforward, but uh, it doesn't take a huge surgery and uh, we end up with uh, happy results 90% of the time. Now, uh, you worked at Shriners for a period of time. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Um, Shriners was a wonderful place to work because we were taking care of kids from all over the Pacific. And these kids uh, didn't have access normally to, uh, to the uh, orthopedic surgeons or, or, or even physicians uh, frequently. And uh, so we saw a lot of things that... Uh, that uh, would have been taken care of in infancy that were, were neglected and then uh, became worse because they were neglected. So, so uh, we could bring a child back uh, from someplace like Fiji or, or a Samoa, uh, do a, uh, a, uh, a relatively straightforward operation for us, and it would totally change the, uh, the child's life from then on. And uh, that was very rewarding. It's uh, it's it's an incredible charity and uh, an incredible um, privilege to be able to to do that kind of work. I mean, so do you find, uh, as a pediatric orthopedic surgeon, that you do the same surgery over and over again, like a lot of specialties? Because I know in Hawaii, anyway, we have orthopedic surgeons that are knee surgeons or shoulder surgeons or hip surgeons, but they don't really do surgery on more than one body part for adults. Is it different with kids? Yeah, it's, it's totally different for kids. Uh, we, uh, if I'm in the operating, my first uh, operating uh, might be on a, an infant's hand, for example. And uh, uh, I, I might make an incision a, a centimeter long. And then the next case might be uh, a 250-pound uh, uh, kid that, uh, that is obese and has problems with growth of his knee because of that. Um, and uh, uh, um, if, 
the, ne the next one might be something that is just totally unique that, uh, that I've never seen before or done before. So it's, it's very diverse and, uh, and that adds to the fun. Uh, it, it's nice to be able to do something. And, and generally speaking, uh, you know, when I was in, in uh, full-time practice, uh, I very seldom uh, had a week where I didn't do something that was pretty, pretty unique to me. Do you, do you find that you do joint replacements in children? Uh, we do do joint replacements. Uh, they, they're, the need is not as great as in, uh, as in the adult population. But at Shriners, we did maybe uh, seven or eight uh, joint replacements a year. Uh, and uh, these were for very special problems, usually uh, things like rheumatoid arthritis uh, or infections of the hip that had destroyed the hip joint, uh, uh, things like that. Uh, different, different reasons, not just the osteoarthritis that is uh, the, the mainstay for, uh, for adults. So what kind of issues do you find with joint replacements in children? Does that mean if you have a joint replacement when you're 10 years old, does that mean you have to have another joint replacement when you're 40 years old? Um, yeah, that's probably true. Um, the, the results of uh, doing the uh, uh, joint replacements in children is, is surprisingly good. Um, they, they do last uh, 20 and 30 years frequently. And, uh, but um, I think to say that, uh, that uh, the joint replacement is going to last for the en entire time of the child's life is, is probably uh, being a little too optimistic. On the other hand, I don't worry about it a whole lot because uh, when the child really needs a replacement, um, he's not going to get a replacement that's as good as what we have today. It's going to be a replacement that is 30 years in the future uh, with all the technology that's going to be acquired in that time. And in the meantime, if I've given a child uh, a uh, hip that uh, functions beautifully from age 11 to age uh, 35 or 40, that that uh, covers a very critical part of his life. And, uh, and to be able to do normal activities and, uh, and enjoy life uh, like uh, normal people during that period of time, you've really, you've really done some good. Uh, so when you uh, do surgery on a child, is their recovery time slower or faster than an adult? How does that work? Oh, it, it's amazing. Uh, you do. You do a large surgery on a child, they're bouncing back uh, and, uh, and they're back to play amazingly quickly. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, that's another happy thing. Uh, the, uh, the, the surgery is tough, but, uh, but the kids bounce, bounce back um, like little rubber balls off a, off a concrete floor. It's just so, amazing. So with adults, you, you have to try to get them to be active after surgery, and they probably don't want to. So on the other hand, it sounds like with children, you don't even have to tell them. They're just going to do that? No, you, you, have to, you have to give them permission. You have to, you have to say, it's OK. You know? and, uh, and sometimes you have to have the physical therapist uh, work with them to, to uh, overcome their fear. But once they've done it once, they'll do it again. And if, uh, and, uh, you know, if it doesn't hurt, then, uh, then they're, they're, uh, they're off and running. So. Wow, it really does sound like kids are such a joy to work with in this environment. So, okay, we're taking a short break. I'm Catherine Knorr. This is Much More on Medicine on the Think Tech live streaming network series. We're talking with Dr. Kent Reinker about innovation in kids' bone surgery. Thanks to our ThinkTech underwriters and grantors, the Atherton Family Foundation, Carol Munley and the Friends of ThinkTech, the Center for Microbial Oceanography Research and Education, Collateral Analytics, the Cook Foundation, Dwayne Carisu, the Hawaii Community Foundation, the Hawaii Council of Associations of Apartment Owners, Hawaii Energy, 
the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum, Hawaiian Electric Company, Integrated Security Technologies, Galen Ho of BAE Systems, Kamehameha Schools, MW Group, the Scheidler Family Foundation, the Sydney Stern Memorial Trust, Volo Foundation, Yuriko J. Sugimura. Thanks so much to you all. We're back. We're live. I'm Catherine Knorr, and, and this is Much More on Medicine on the Think Tech live streaming network series, talking with Dr. Kent Reinker about innovations in kids' bone surgery. So, Doctor, what's an important innovation that you would like to tell us about? Um, well, the one that, that I'm uh, currently writing about is uh, the titanium rib. And uh, this is a device that, uh, that arose out of the uh, uh, basically trying to save children's lives. Um, it's unusual for orthopedic surgeons to save people's lives, but uh, this particular one uh, does. And uh, so um, it was invented uh, by a, uh, a colleague of mine, uh, a person that uh, actually I became partners with at the University of Texas. And he has a Hawaii connection in that, uh, in that he did his internship uh, at uh, Trip Army Medical Center. Um, and then uh, he was faced uh, with uh, a child who had an absence of part, a part of his rib cage. And, uh, um, you know, the, the rib cage works like a, like a bicycle pump. Um, uh, if you have a bicycle pump, you depend upon this rigid tube uh, to pump the air. If the tube isn't rigid, uh, then, it, then it would suck in at the sides and you wouldn't get any air to flow. And the same way with our, uh, with our rib cage, the ribs, uh, coming around here, stabilize it so that when you take a deep breath in, the uh, it doesn't uh, the soft tissues don't suck in on the side. And so this particular child had uh, an absence of uh, a part of his rib cage on the uh, right side of his body. So um, uh, he had a life expectancy of uh, probably less than six months, and uh, so. Uh, Something had to be done about this, and so uh, Bob Campbell, uh, the uh, the orthopedic surgeon, and Mel Smith, uh, who was a thoracic surgeon, decided they would uh, jury rig it and just use some wires that are used for fracture fixation to try to stabilize the the rib, and uh, and uh, it worked. And all of a sudden, the child is off the respirator, uh, is no longer in danger of uh, suffocation. And the only problem is that those wires that they put in uh, basically wrapped around the rib at the bottom that was present and the one at the top uh, uh, wasn't going to grow with the child. And uh, he's toddler age, so, uh, so he's got a lot of growing to do. So what did they do in order to make that work for the growth? So Bob Campbell then uh, worked out a, a system. He sort of thought, well, if I make something that works like a curtain rod, where, uh, where uh, you spread it apart and there's one part that slides inside the other part, then we can, we can slide this apart, make a tiny little incision, put a little peg in to hold it uh, out, and, the, and, the, and by doing that every six months, this can grow with the patient. So that's where so, the creativity comes in. So this is, yeah, definitely creativity and uh, design. So he shopped around and went to a, a custom device maker, uh, implant maker, uh, in California, and. Uh, and they made one of these uh, uh, devices and put it in, a, in the child. And that was the first titanium rib. It was made out of titanium, which is, uh, everybody thinks titanium is really strong. That's, uh, that's not, that comes from its name. But the real value of titanium is that it 
doesn't rust at all. So it has uh, very little wear problems. It has it can basically be in the body forever and uh, and uh, last for for decades within the body without uh, um, rusting. Did this so. increase the um, morbidity of this child? I mean, the increase the like how his his um, length of life. Um, well, the, the, what uh, what uh, what happened with the child is that uh, they they put it in, and they and there were two of the first implants. Um, they uh, they basically ended up uh, changing this out, uh, and uh, and uh, about twenty years later, he graduated from college, and uh, and he he did uh, have a demise uh, in his twenties, but uh, he got. Uh, 20 years of good life uh, what, and from this had, device. Had he uh, not had the device, what was um, the expected uh, length of life? Um, he, he would surely have not met, uh, uh, lived to be more than two years old. Oh, okay. How old was he when it was implanted? It was put in when he was about 18 months old. Okay. So can we look at the image and maybe you can explain what it shows? Yeah, this is uh, this is not that particular patient. This is a, an, a, another patient. Uh, but as you as you look on on those gold things, those are the titanium ribs. One of them goes from rib to rib. Uh, the other one goes from the rib and then uh, attaches down to the spine. And you can see that there are no ribs on, on that one side. So they're bridging this uh, this gap and stabilizing the chest. But the one that goes to the spine also, uh, if you stretch it out, it's going to stretch out that curvature of the spine that you see. So this patient has, uh, has not just a rib cage problem, but a spinal problem as well. And by uh, uh, using this later design of uh, what we call the Vector uh, device, it's uh, vertical expandable prosthetic titanium rib. Um, and that's a proprietary de device. Uh, by using that, we can uh, uh, we can uh, uh, address both problems at the same time. Not just the rib cage problem, but also the curvature of the spine. Oh, interesting. Um, so, what is the process of getting government approval of these devices? Well, the, the normal governmental approval problem uh, is, uh, is uh, first of all, you use it uh, on animals first, and if you can. Um, in this case, you can't do that, really. Um, there is not a good animal model that could, it could be used on. Um, so then, uh, so then uh, you, uh, you uh, design whatever thing you think will solve your patient's problem, and, uh, and uh, you have to send that into the FDA. And, uh, and uh, after you've done a few of these, uh, you're probably going to have to do a feasibility study, what's called a feasibility study. And what that is, is to basically uh, indicate whether this is a safe procedure in a small number of patients. Uh, and that means sending data in on every pr procedure you, you do to the FDA. Um, if uh, that then works out, and uh, then you'll do a larger study, usually in a multi-center study uh, in many different hospitals, uh, and uh, go through that process. And uh, that then uh, shows whether uh, it actually solves the problem that you're trying to solve. Now, the feasibility study is oriented towards safety to begin with. And then afterwards, uh, you usually lead, uh, need larger numbers in order to prove that, uh, that you're really solving the problem that you're trying to prove. Is most um, of the innovation done overseas or in the United States? Um, the fact is, in spine surgery in particular, uh, almost all of the innovations have come from overseas because it's been very difficult uh, because of our really rather stringent laws uh, and uh, uh, to get things developed uh, within the United States. So um, a lot of the innovations in spine surgery uh, have come from overseas, from Korea, 
uh, from France, uh, for example, for the spine implement plants that we do, um, uh, and uh, elsewhere. Um, the, uh, 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 the titanium rib uh, was one of the uh, exceptions to this rule, and that was due to a particular uh, complex of events. Uh, number one, because you're actually treating a life-threatening uh, disease. And so uh, if, you, uh, if you have, uh, you're getting given a little bit more leeway if you're saving kids' lives. Mm. Um, okay. so, so, you, so the FDA actually really worked together with uh, the uh, innovators in order to get this, uh, this approved. Despite that, it took 17 years. Wow. 17 years of work before it, uh, before it got approved. Oh, my goodness. Um, so you mentioned you're writing about this. Uh, so what are you writing? Well, it's a, it's a very human story because uh, you've got uh, 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 a lot of complications along the road. Uh, you've got uh, uh, very interesting uh, people that were developing this. Um, it's sort of a win-win story in a way because uh, although the FDA had, uh, had the obligation of proving that this was effective and, and, uh, and, and a good thing to do, it wasn't, uh, uh, they helped. They really helped. It wasn't like they, they uh, went, uh, 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 they went overboard in order to ensure that this thing uh, really got approved. Is, so, is that a nonfiction so work or is that fiction that you're writing? Uh, this is, this is uh, nonfiction. Really. Oh, okay. It's okay. nonfiction, yeah. So if we want to read your fiction, how do we uh, find it? Uh, all, all of my books are on Amazon. Uh, most of them are thrillers. Uh, I've got two mysteries out there. Um, I publish all of the, uh, the uh, 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 the thrillers under Elaine Gunn, and then anything that's not a thriller goes under AK Gunn. Very yeah. interesting, Doctor. It's been terrific having you. Um, so I'm I'm excited because I've learned so much about uh, pediatric orthopedics, and um, I'm definitely going to take a look at your books. Uh, so, okay, we're about out of time, and uh, we'll have to wrap it up. I'm Catherine Knorr. This is much more on medicine on the ThinkTech live streaming network series. We've been talking with Dr. Kent Reinker about innovation in kids' bone surgery. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks to our broadcast engineer, our floor manager, and to Jay Fidel, our executive producer. It's it all together. Please join us for future ThinkTech productions.